All right, so my study for the last about year or so was a study of the causes and solutions for flooding in the black dirt region of um, Orange County, New York. Now, what I want to talk about first is the different kind of soil types that are found in New York. Where we're going to focus on today is down here in Orange County. So let's see the types of soils that are found there. There are about four, three or four of them. If you see in the pink, um, there's a like type of acidy soils that are found there. Um, in that area, area as well, there's moderate to fine textured glacial lake type soils that have been produced there. And if you can see the dark blue, that's muck, also known as black dirt. So here's the area of study. You see the black dirt area right over here. It's about We have about 26,000 acres of that land. And it's about an hour and 10 minutes north of here. Okay, so some history and information about black dirt. It is known as some of the most fertile and profitable soils in the world. It is derived from the bottoms of shallow lakes formed from the lash glaciers melted in a way thousands of years ago. And some areas you can find as much as 30 feet of this stuff, which is really nice because it's very profitable for crops. This is an actual picture of one of the areas that I um, was studying. On, a, on farmland. Now the reason that the soils are black is because of its organic matter and inorganic content that's in there. And it's um, basically built up constantly of decay, decayed plant and animal material. And in, this animal and plant material has never been exposed to bacteria so it wasn't broken down. So it's been staying there for thousands of years. Okay, so the region. There are about 22 square miles of black dirt found in Orange County, New York. And they're in the hamlets and towns of Pine Island. Uh, you can find them in Goshen, way, way yonder, and you can find them in the town of Florida. Over the century, the soils have been used for producing onions, onion-related crops. The average yield of each acre of onions is about 40,000 pounds per acre. So it's, it's, this crop is extremely valuable, this area. The Black Dirt region of Orange County is the fifth largest onion producer in the country. The first largest area is in the Everglades. Black Dirt is found most prominent down there in South Florida, something I never knew. Um, content basically of um, the Black Dirt contains pyruvic acid. Onions grown in these soils have high sulfur content. And other crops that are included that they grow around here includes the lettuce, radish, potatoes, tomatoes, carrots, and now the popular sod. Okay, so I want to focus on, this study was okay, there's been a lot of flooding going on. This is a flat, flat area, it's called a floodplain. What can we do to limit it? Well, we need to understand what the causes are of the flooding first. Three main things, erosion from the river that borders the black dirt area, air erosion, and climate change. Let's go to erosion up from the river first. Basically, the river is constantly moving, right? It has rapidly moving water and accelerates the erosion of the stream banks constantly. There's also air erosion. There's blowing of dry organic soils during the dry periods when the, there's no crop cover. And there's climate change. Everybody's seen the climate, the storms are getting more intense. Um, rainwater, rainstorms, are causing storms to produce much more precipitation than um, remembered by local farmers in the past. Here's a picture of flooding in this area. I think it was in April 2007. Totally destroyed the crop for that year. Some background. Orange County was settled by Europeans probably in the late 18, early 1900s. They consisted of German, Polish, Dutch immigrants who worked with these muckland type soils in their native countries. So they brought this practice over with them when they came to America. And the draining of the agriculture was done in Europe, and so they brought those practices with them as well. But of course, they're not as good as the technology that we use today. They also had, um, they did straightening of the river channels and created canals and pumps to dry out the land. Now, the current problems, the, um, one of the worst floods, we have three dates here, October 2005, April 2007, and March 2010, were the worst times of flooding there. And um, the thing is that there's a frequent overflow of the rivers and the creeks, and uh, there's a lot of clogging of the tributaries, these small little other rivers and creeks that drain right into the Walkville River. 
And this is usually due to the uh, sedimentation, debris that falls in, erosion, and any vegetation that hangs right outside the banks of the river that slow the water down and ends up clogging, hence flooding. Okay, so we want to focus on these objectives. I wanted to explore the history of the drainage that has made that made these lands available for farming first. I wanted to look at the I can't see. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, we wanted to also look at the current prospects for controlling the flooding, and we wanted to determine how helpful stakeholders are on the land use options that are available to them now. So stakeholders, what I mean, that includes farmers, that includes regulatory agencies, and environmentalists that all have to do with this, with this topic and this problem. So what I did to formulate the best way of studying this was I set up interviews. Um, what I did was I wanted to find out the impact of flooding that can be determined by interviewing these people directly who work and live and breathe in this stuff pretty much. And also, I wanted to focus on the public's opinion, their practices of farmers, and the solutions proposed as reasonable. So the process of the interviews started by arranging appointments. I made phone calls, I set up times to meet with everyone, and once I got there, I was able to, um, I usually recorded all the interviews through a tape recorder, and I just wrote them down on notes as well. And I also had the opportunity to take pictures of the areas as well. And I usually did a step-by-step -step questions that were pre-planned and written for the interviews. The location was all throughout Orange County, New York, at their places of work, where I was e easily provided maps, um, any studies, tours, and uh, other, other relevant material. So the first person I interviewed, who was the one who actually introduced me to this um, study that's been going on for a while, is Simon Gruber. He is an environmental planner for the Orange County Land Trust, and he proposed this project. And basically, I kind of piggybacked on what he was doing. So we had to meet with farmers and environmentalists over time. That's what he did, basically did that. Uh, he introduced the idea. One of the ideas was to remove a lot of the trees through, from the Walk Hill River. That's also known as clearing and snagging. And then um, we also wanted to see if we can propose restoration plans of what, putting wet, wetlands back into the area. That really did get too much enthusiasm, as you see when I um, go into the other interviews. Because basically, a lot of this area was formerly wetlands. And um, it was cleared out to, do this, to use this farmland. Okay, some non structural measures that Gruber proposed as alternatives for flooding was to have a permanent flood plain evacuation, have flood proofing or flood forecasting. Um, limit the amount of crops that are produced, so if there is flooding, they're not going to lose a massive amount of money. Choose the right crops that can kind of withstand some of this flooding, and also have uh, tax adjustments or flood insurance. Simon also proposed, which I thought was an interesting idea, was the use of adding willow trees into the area. Willow trees are found in wetland areas. They're known to reduce flooding. They are used as biofiltrators. They're grown in wetlands. They're used for ecological wastewater. They're helped in land reclamation, stream bank stabilization, slope stabilization, soil erosion control, and um, they're windbreakers, and they help in soil building. And they grow very, these trees are known to grow extremely fast. They have a strong, tough root system, and that is why they help protect the soil from water erosion. And these willows are used in even ethanol um, production as a biofuel. So they're quite valuable. Next um, person that I did interview was a senior planner for the Orange County Department of Planning with Kelly Dobbins. She discussed that flooding clearly, as all we can all agree, is getting worse due to natural subsidence. And the number, she's noticed, and there are studies that have been done, that the number of fish species in the Walpole River has decreased. This is pretty much due to the constant years of dredging, getting the river deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, to try to uh, limit flooding to happen, but the problem is we're affecting the natural habitat there. And there's also by the Walk Hill River and where the black dirt is, there are two landfills. There's the Alturi landfill and there's the Orange County landfill. The problem is that area is slumping into the river. And so as a result, you have toxins from the landfill going into the river, of course. Pollutants, there's increased turbidity, and there, um, 
All of that, a lot of it is due to the clearing and snagging of trees that are flowing right into the river, clogging up everything. Okay. So in the 1940s, she explained to me that the Army Corps of Engineers and the Walk Hill Watershed Conservation and Management Plan created an alternate route for the Walk Hills Channel. So this is good. I'm getting an idea of kind of like what has been done in the past. This helped to dig a straighter and deeper channel for water to move it downstream to avoid flooding. This had a negative impact. The reason was, again, it goes back to the species problem. Um, and within, after about 36 years of investigation, they saw that 48 species um, went, it, it decreased from 48 species to 16 of the fish species. So clearly, dredging is not the smartest thing to do. So we want to kind of avoid that. She talked about, which is interesting, a reconnaissance study to complete. This is first where environmentalists, um, anyone, engineers, go out into the field. There's no new data generated. They're just going to look out there and see what's going on. How can they kind of change the area around? So that's just a reconnaissance study. The next thing after that's done, they have a feasibility study. Feasibility study usually generates new data, and it can cost a lot of money, on average $2 million. This is usually funded by the Army Corps of Engineers, but that's only if funding is available. That's another problem. Nowadays, the economy is not doing well, so funding is going to be a problem. And also, staff members usually tour the region to speak to local farmers about the situation and get an idea of what the problem is. They've realized that there's a massive silpar deposits in the area of the Walk Hill River that cause problems and start um, backing up the river. Now, there are two creeks. There's the Rutgers and Quaker Creek, which I'm going to show you a map right now where they're located. There are two major tributaries that empty right into the river. The thing is, the river goes from north to south. And so, it usually, well, actually, it goes from south to north. So, it's kind of different from all the other rivers. So, that, I've also learned that they are in extreme need of snagging people as well. Okay, so here's a good map that you can see everything. Um, here, this is the Walker River. It's going from south to north versus the Hudson River goes north to south. So you have these two major tributaries, the Rutgers and the Quaker Creek, that drain in here. There's a lot of problems with those two creeks. There's um, a lot of snagging. There's a lot of trees around. There's uh, just constantly issues that are going on there that are causing more flooding. So I'm going to try to do some studies on that to try to limit that. One of the reasons, one of the other problems is our constriction points. This are, which are rock ledges. You can see this, if you go to the, to, I think it, this one's in Quaker Creek, this is an example of one. These ledges usually cause a backup of water, restricting drainage of the water from other neighboring lands and the ability for the channel to pass the flood water. Okay. Third person I interviewed was out in Goshen. He's the building inspector for building and zoning for the town of uh, Goshen. It's Howanen. He discussed basically that black dirt is a floodplain, and the Army Corps of Engineers have projects in the floodplain, to and they need to develop permits that need under uh, FEMA. There is a maintenance road actually that he told me about that there is um, now, but it constantly needs to be maintained. This maintenance road, people actually go into, engineers go into, they go in there, it's right there, borders the Walker River, they're constantly clearing out the area, but that takes money, that takes time, that takes effort. And it doesn't go away. You have to constantly be there and maintain it. I talked about the uh, landfill. He told me that there is a substance, another problem with pollutants, there's a substance along the landfill that causes degradation of the water. It erodes, erodes the soils, thus raising the water levels. So that's another problem we have. There's also selective cutting that can be done um, to clear most of these problems. Selective cutting versus clear cutting, you know, the different uh, selective cutting basically is you're cutting down certain species of trees but keeping other ones there versus clear cutting, you're cutting down everything. So some people agree with um, selective cutting. Farmers apparently prefer clear cutting. It's a little opinionated, and other, that's another thing. Okay, so this is actually an actual picture of, uh, I think this is the Alturi landfill. They're both right there by the Walker River. See, it's right here. The dirt is slumping into the river. There's no, and nobody's really maintaining that. I think these landfills are already closed. And there's another discussion of bleachy. There's this orange stuff that's coming out from uh, one of the, land, the landfills. They're still just going into the soil, hence going into the, into the Walkville River. So that's another thing of concern. 
Because you don't want that in your, in your black dirt, especially when you're growing crops. OK. So some proposal alternatives Neil was talking to me about was uh, rain gardens. So you can see here, you can uh, use rain gardens with different types of vegetation, kind of slows the, um, the rate of water, the velocity of it, holds it in there, it filters it, it, it just stays away from the black dirt area. And, um, and that's an idea. Or we can also ha use stormwater storage tanks. I don't know if anybody's really using that. Um, it's just, it's very costly, and I don't know if it's economically effective, really, for the, a lot of the farmers. Okay, so the next person, I interviewed, interviewed a total of six people, by the way. Um, this is the fourth person. He is, this, he's a conservation district manager for Orange County, Kevin Sumner. And he usually is the one who provides a lot of the funding for large-scale projects. Uh, he works with the Army Corps of Engineers, and um, he helps in providing funding and construction for uh, dikes and pumps uh, for the farmers. There is a constant maintenance of these dikes and of these, uh, there are these trenches that they have along the, the areas of the farmland. So he takes care of that. He helps go out there. And uh, it is believed that most of the, I didn't know this, this is interesting, it is believed that most of the flooding is initiated from Lake Mohawk in New Jersey, which drains the river from uh, in north into the Waukee River. So that's a picture of where Lake Mohawk is. Okay. And these are my two farmers. These are the, I have the best time with them. They're kind of interesting. The first one was uh, John Ruskowitz. He's a, a black dirt farmer in the town of Pine Island, right in the heart of it all. He lives right in Pine Island. In uh, 2010, he owned a total of 230 acres right now, and farms about 206 acres of that. He, owns, he has about 22 miles of drainage ditches along all of his uh, farmland um, that's on his property. And his first effort at flood control started in the 1930s, and he has been at this, in this area in Pine Island for years. Um, basically, he started with, in, in the 1930s with the Army Corps of Engineers, which assigned about 2,000 members of the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, to clear and straighten the channel of the Wolfville River. So this has been going on a long time. These are actual pictures. I was with him in his, in his truck when we were driving around this area. These are a lot of the ditches that he has. Now, like anything, like the river, you have to maintain them. They're constantly getting caught. So it costs a lot of money. He has people to work with him, and they take care of it. And most of the water just drains right into these ditches, and from there they go right into the wall the river. And that's the same, another one as well. Now, he has a pump. Sometimes these He's this flooding is like immense, really bad. So he uses the, these pumps to um, just to get rid of the water a little faster. Okay, so I asked him about the idea of wetland restoration because that's what Simon Gruber had mentioned was a good idea. And um, basically, I explained to him something about um, in already in upstate New York, there are some areas that have black dirt, and they're already doing a lot of this, restoring <coughs> certain areas back to wetlands. And they're doing this under what is called the Wetland uh, Reserve Program. Basically what that is, it's a program that pays a one-time fee for a conservation easement, and it pays the cost of altering drainage to, and re to restore back to wetlands um, on site. Uh, it says here that in Orange County, the price for this easement was recently raised to $6,000 from uh, $1,500. So you, if you're a farmer up there and you are willing to restore some of this area back to wetland, they will pay you for it. So it's, it's actually an incentive. And um, basically, I gave the scenario to him, even if I'm like the idea. He called it a pipe drain, which is, it was a waste of time, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of effort. Basically, he wants to keep all his land that he has. And because the more you have, the more crops you have, the more profit you can make. And then he made the question of, well, how much water can a wetland really hold? Depending on how big the wetland is, too. He talked about um, that he has certain crops that, are, that he can use that are resilient to flooding. Um, he has cover crops that he uses, which include barley, and that usually prevents a lot of the soil from blowing away, so that's soil erosion, um, during a lot of the dry spells uh, throughout the year. 
The last person was this guy here, Leonard Dubuc. They literally live right across the street from each other. And this is part of uh, his farm behind him. Okay, so Lenny moved from Michigan in around in 1980, where his family uh, ran a side farm. So he's sim he, he, he knows the land, he knows how to work it. He's been in the, fam in the family business for a long time, many years. His main crops there are sod, onions, sweet corn, and, uh, and lettuce. The problem here, he proposes that uh, most, of the, most of the studies and the research takes time. And there's not a, he feels that you don't have time to waste on studies. Because the longer we st do studies, the higher chance of flooding is going to happen. So he talked about um, another maintenance room, which is a, a considered a worthwhile project. And um, he said this is a 12-mile long road that was built in 1983, and it's along the walk hill to clean out vegetation and falls, that falls into the river. And that's the same one I was telling, telling you about beforehand. And it's still in use now. He discussed the proposal of do, making what's called riprap in the, in the river. And um, this is basically shouldering at the toe of the river with these types of rocks. Slow, clearly will slow down uh, the flow of water. He also discussed what is called longitudinal peak toe, stone toe protection. And what this is, basically constructed of well-graded, self-adjusting, and self-filtering rocks with no filter underneath. And there's, there's a certain type of vegetation that it has to resist erosive flow of the stream and that are placed there. It does not protect the mid and upper banks of the area. It's just again for the, the ends of the banks. So it's usually means to just slow down. You have rocks, if you have a certain type of vegetation there, it can slow down soil erosion and the water as well. But then in the, in the problem is, you still have a lot of the, the snagging of a lot of the trees. But that's one of the other alternatives that they do have and that he recommended to do. He also mentioned, which I did mention before from another person that I interviewed, the willow trees that um, can be put along the ditches and the stream banks. The roots become entangled and they hold the bank together. But when the water table rises, the branches lean into the stream and slow the water down. So that's what we kind of want. But yet we don't want it to get stuck and start overflowing. So. And then he usually believes that this study um, today will focus on how to put natural vegetation close to the river to help the, solve the problem. Okay, so some more of his alternatives um, includes, instead of improving drainage, he wanted to maybe revert back to um, a lot of the area to its original state, like other environmentalists wanted, him, wanted farmers to do, doing the wetland restoration. He's kind of more open to uh, suggestions versus John Ruskowitz. Um, the struggle, there's, the problem is that there's always a struggle between environmentalists and farmers. There's this opinion, I want this, I want that, I don't think this, I don't think that. So, uh, he's experienced that through a lot of meetings he's been through. And uh, also to continue using drainage pumps, which are expensive to offer and maintain. And I will show you a picture of that right now that he has. This is that uh, drainage pump that he has on his land. I think he has more than one, but this is an area where he, he showed me from the, towards the back, right near the Walco River. Basically what happens is um, he has all these trenches, and from there it drains into this pond, and from there he uses this pump which is powered by diesel fuel, and it drains directly into the river. It usually drains water into the Walker River. This pump is a 24-inch pump, and pumps about 10,000 gallons of, um, of water off the farm and per minute. So it's pretty strong. It works with a high volume under low pressure. He gave me this interesting scenario. He said, if you had uh, 240 acres to get one inch of water off of that entire land mass, it would take you 24 hours. So farmers fear, but one thing is that they fear that nothing's going to be done, nothing's going to improve that, the, the flooding issue. Uh, prolonged studies with, no, there'll be prolonged studies with no solution. It's going to be going on and on and nothing's going to be happening. But that, the studies cost money as well. And that there's also going to be just small fixes from larger past projects um, from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Environmental Conservation and they're not going to permanently fix something. And um, they, farmers are not so excited about, apparently from what I've gotten, about bioengineering 
wetland restoration or rain gardens because again they're going to lose acres, they're going to lose money, they're going to lose crops. <laughs> Stakeholders have been usually having a positive attitude about the issue, um, such as Neil, who I spoke to, who is in um, Goshen, he does the permits and so forth, and they're willing to help. They want to help, which just sometimes gets tough with the farmers. Leonard DeBuck, I would say, was probably the uh, most probably the most open to the suggestions that were, and the matters that, that were given to him. Um, and he wants to take kind of matters into his own hands, do his own projects, because it's just taking too much time, a lot of these studies. Um, and then most are in tune with environmentalists. And John Ruskowitz, he was, I would say, he just wants quick fix, something fast done so we can get this over with. And, but clearly it's been going on for years, how can there be a quick fix? So he's kind of stuck in, the, in those old ways. Um, I mentioned, we mentioned retention ponds could be in, installed in the area of, of where there are large parking lots. Um, basically in the area where these farmers live on, right there on the farmland. There's the houses, there, they have parking lots there. Maybe we can put those retention ponds there and uh, on driveways upstream and uh, especially in New Jersey. We need, there needs to be better construction of, the store and store, of stormwater management, better employees, more focused on the issue. Add more drainage ditches. I don't know, the better, the more the better. Um, and personally, I, there, I felt that there was, there's not gonna be a permanent fix, I don't think. I think there's always going to be maintenance, constant maintenance, constant attention. But with all that, there's money that's involved. And uh, because the river is constantly moving, it's changing its direction, its form, its shape. And that area where the, where the black dirt is, it's a blood plain, it's flat. So you know what is just going to sit there. So combine funding with from multiple sources. You can't just depend on one place for funding, especially nowadays when the economy is really bad. I mean, you know, the DEC, there's like no jobs practically. And they're on a hiring freeze. So you really don't have the manpower to do a lot of this stuff right now. There's going to be constant adjustments, evaluations on um, these on pro projects that have been completed and new projects. Proper management and communication between stakeholders and environmentalists and the Army Corps of Engineers has to be, and that's probably key. They need to work together. The problem is everybody has their own opinion on this and that. And um, national and economic conditions put all studies into question. Again, money issue. Now, just recently, there was um, I saw this article where Obama has given a, President Obama has given us a budget for tw 2011 of 4.939 billion dollars um, for the Civil Works Program of the Army Corps of Engineers, and this is used. This money is going to be now used for navigation, flood and coastal storm damage reduction, as well as aquatic system restoration. I've heard what's going on down in the south in the Mississippi area. Most of the money is probably right now going there. They're not going to really care about what's going on up here. Um, the other problem is the federal and state and local government has, in a way, has no obligation to ensure the profitability of these lands sinking due to over farming, erosion, and climate change. If something happens to the area, well, we can do our best, but we're sorry you lost your money to those farmers. So it's just some thoughts I have on this, on this type of study. Um, Flooding will always be an issue nationwide and worldwide. We look at the issues in right now currently going on down south. Um, there's, gonna, there's always going to be new staff at the county level, and that might allow for consideration of extensive stream uh, corridor restoration pro projects. Depending on who you have in these, in these companies in, um, on the state level will determine what types of projects you're gonna get, what you're gonna get funded for as well. And, um, it's just a, it's like a, a win-win, lose-lose situation. It, does, it really doesn't matter. It's, just, it's a gamble that a lot of these farmers take. But overall, it was a pleasure working with these people. It was a good way to um, get another view on the issue. And I hope to definitely be involved more to see what has gone on and maybe how I can make an impact on the area. Thank you.